So welcome everyone. Um, my name is Adam Mestian and I'm an assistant professor at the history department of Duke University. And I would like to extend my warm welcome to everyone. Um, today, our guest is Mohamed Waldi, uh, professor at Sciences Po in Paris. And um, before introducing him, let me just say um, a, a great thank you or warm, warm thank you to uh, Griffin Orlando and Julie Maxwell from the Duke University Middle East Studies Center who enabled uh, this uh, session and who organized it. And also to Ellen McClarney, the director of the Duke University Middle East Studies Center. Thank you very much. So welcome everyone. Today, uh, our guest is Mohamed Waldi. Uh, who is a full professor of history at Sciences Po Paris. And thank you so much, Mohamed, for, for joining us today. I know it's, uh, it's very late in Paris, uh, but hopefully you are still before dinner. And uh, I, I, I very much look forward to the presentation. Mohamed Wadi is a historian of early modern and modern North Africa, trained in Arabic at Inalco Paris, and in history at, the Sorb at, Hor at Sorbonne University. Um, he taught um, at Inalco in Paris, and he was uh, tenured, he reached a tenured associate professorship at Princeton University. And then uh, he returned to Sciences Po just last year uh, to Paris. Uh, so uh, Mohamed Waldi is, uh, is a fascinating example of, uh, of, uh, of a competition among the best universities of the world for, for talent and, uh, and, and research skills. And we are so fortunate today that you join us. I would like to say uh, a couple of sentences about uh, Professor Waldi's um, uh, work. He is a revolutionary historian who is looking at especially the Arabic sources of modern North African history and questions or, or, or in a critical perspective of the colonial paradigm. Um, we will discuss some of these aspects after his lecture as well. His first book, Esclave et Maître, in 2011, um, was a breakthrough in understanding the slaves and servants of the Tunisian uh, base household in the 18th and 19th centuries. His new book, which uh, received uh, the Nikki Keddy Book Award uh, honorable mention just, uh, just a couple of weeks ago at, uh, our, uh, at our association, the Middle East Studies Association, is entitled um, A Slave Between Empires uh, and is a fascinating uh, book about a fascinating case, but I don't want to talk more about that book because you will, you will present some of, some of the most interesting dimensions of that book. I just finished the book and I have so many questions and I really enjoyed it. And any congratulations once again to, to, to the, both the honorable mention and, and the book itself. Uh, before I give the floor to Mohamed Waldi, I just want to say that uh, he is at the moment also directing a European Research Council international project on slavery in North Africa and uh, is a major project now uh, in Europe about the 19th and uh, 20th century as well as far as I understand, uh, but uh, you, may, you may talk more about this. So welcome, thank you very much and the floor is yours. Before you start, sorry, once more, I have to announce that the chat is disabled. So those who would like to ask questions, please put it in the Q&A. Everybody, please have a look in the, in the, in the, in the bottom of your, of your screen. You can, you can pose your questions in the Q&A. If you, if you push that button in the Q&A button there, and I will, uh, I will pose the questions to Professor Waldi after his lecture. So the, we proceed with uh, around a 25, 30 minute lecture, and then we will have a Q&A uh, um, uh, for, for everybody. So thank you very much, welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much. So um, I will share the screen. 
in order to show you the PowerPoint. I think it's working. So I wanted first to thank Duke University for inviting me today, and especially Adam Mestian for accepting to respond to this talk, and Griffin Orlando and Julie Maxwell for putting this event together. Um, I'm very pleased to share with you some ideas from my second book published by uh, uh, Columbia University Press. So um, this book, there is an issue with the uh, PowerPoint. Hopefully I will, yeah, so yeah. So this book uh, has been published by Columbia University Press. And in fact, it's an opportunity for me to go back to an aspect of the book that I didn't really develop. Um, and to do so, um, I'll start my presentation by a quotation um, and the following quotation. Nowadays, countries where full liberty exists and no enslavement is permitted are more prosperous than other countries. I myself believe that universal liberty and the non-existence of slavery have a deep effect on refining a man's manners as well on the development of culture. So the, the author of these two sentences was not a European or British abolitionist. The man who phrased these two ideas called Hussein bin Abdullah was actually an Ottoman official acting in North Africa namely in the local administration of the Ottoman province of Tunis that you can see right at the center of this map. And when writing these sentences in 1864, this Ottoman official, Hossein, was replying to a query from the US consul in Tunis, Amos Perry. US consul Perry was reaching out to Hossein to know more, I quote, about the effects of slavery on Tunisia and the effect of its abolition in Tunisia in a specific context uh, for the USA as the civil war was raging in the country. Not only was a Westerner diplomat seeking advice from a so-called oriental statesman, even more remarkable uh, in this story, the advisor in that matter, Hussein bin Abdullah, had a first-hand experience of slavery. He himself was a former slave, a manumitted slave. In this sense, Hussein shared a common point with many slaves acting in the closest entourage of Ottoman leaders across the empire. Hussein, like these other slaves from the elite, held from a specific region of the Caucasus. He was born in Circassia, in the gray area that you can see on this map. And Circassia was a place where until the second half of the 19th century, parents and families would sell their kids, hoping that these kids would enjoy a better life outside of Circassia, across the Ottoman Empire, in Ottoman palaces um, has uh, uh, officials and as well as concubines for the women. Hossein was snatched from the Caucasus and then sold as a child in Anatolia to the Ottoman governors of Tunisia. And the Tunisian governors raised Hossein and they trained him in their main palace in Tunis to become an official in their own administration. It could be quite logical, therefore, to explain Hossein's abolitionist stance by the single fact that he was a former slave who decided to struggle against slavery. However, that would not be sufficient to understand the main logic uh, behind Hossein's argument in his reply to the US Council. To explore these arguments, and their logic. Um, I will divide my presentation in three sections, three short sections for a talk of 30 minutes. First, I will summarize 
the entire reply of Hussein to show that Hussein pro-abolitionist statement um, was only one fragment of his speech. I show that Hussein aimed more broadly at depicting the Ottoman province of Tunis as an Islamic country that according to him was way more advanced than Western countries. An Islamic country that not only respected slaves, but that succeeded at emancipating slaves and abolishing slavery, according to Hussein again. Then I will locate Hussein's intervention in a provincial context against the backdrop of two major reforms implemented in the Ottoman province of Tunis. First, according to the ban on slave trade and the general emancipation of slaves in the 1840s. Then, above all, in relation to the enactment of a constitution in Tunisia in 1861. At this point, we will see that Hussein's intervention on the issue of abolition and slavery is entangled in a broader debate about state and economic modernization, not only in the West, but as well across the Islamic world. However, as we will see in the third and last section, Hussein's efforts to describe the Ottoman province of Tunisia as a template for the US did not match the actual situation in 1860s Tunisia. In the Ottoman province of Tunis, by the second half of the 19th century, female slaves from places like Circassia and above all, slaves hailing from West Africa were still, slave, were still sold and they were still working in many households across Tunisia. Here Hussein and the case of Hussein illustrate the extent to which conversations between Western diplomats and Ottoman officials about the abolition of slavery actually shaped a mainstream narrative about the history of slavery in this region. A mainstream narrative that we will see is still prevalent nowadays in a country like Tunisia. In other words, facing Westerners' questions and opinions about slavery in their own countries, Ottoman officials chose to paint a rosy picture by defending the idea of a good treatment of the slaves under the guidance of Islam, and in the Tunisian case, by portraying the 1840s uh, policy against uh, slave trade as a successful abolition compared to other legal abolitions in the West. So let's maybe start with the uh, reply of Hussein in the first section. So, Anglophone historians of slavery and of the demise of slavery in 19th century Muslim world are quite aware of the existence of Hussein's reply to the US Consul in 1864. Raif Khouri, um, in 1983, published the main excerpts of Hussein's reply in a collection of primary sources under the Eurocentric title, Modern Arab Thought, Channels of the French Revolution to the Arab East. However, most historians did not look at the entirety of this inter intervention, despite the fact that Hussein published his reply in Arabic. And interestingly, he published as well in July, 1865, the translation of his reply in French in several newspapers across Europe, including in this francophone newspaper, uh, L'Europe. So in July, 1865, uh, here you can see a picture of one of the two pages reporting the reply of Jose. So in itself, uh, the outline of Hossein's reply is very telling. 
Hossein starts by reminding his readers three main questions that, Hossein, that the US Consul Perry raised and that I will here summarize and rephrase. First question, how and to what extent did slavery impact Tunisia? And then second question, was the abolition of slavery met by Tunisians with sorrow or with joy? And third question, which of the two kinds of labor has been proved by experience to be more suitable, uh, forced labor or free labor? Before replying to this question, Hussein starts by presenting what he sees as the main teachings of Islam regarding slavery, namely the manumissions, or more precisely, the need for each and every Muslim to free or manumitted or to manumit his or her slaves. From there, and in line with this Islamic basic principle, Hussein presents a Tunisian policy that the Tunisian governor from 1837 to 1859, and you, have, you can see a portrait of Ahmed Bey. So the policy that Ahmed Bey implemented to ban slave trade and then to set free each and every slave setting foot or living in the province of Tunis. Hussein then claims that Tunisians eventually accepted such policy, which actually was not the case at all. Then Hussein argues in favor of free labor over, over forced labor, claiming that free men need to be industrious. And finally, Hussein calls the US officials to be bold and to set free the slave living in the US. So people versed in the history of the US Civil War, which is not at all my case, uh, would understand why US Consul Amos Perry was investigating about the effects of slavery and the effects of abolition in a society like the Tunisian society. During the summer 1863, as a turning point in the civil war, the Union, the Union Army defeated the, Confeder the Confederate forces at the Battle of Gettysburg. And in such context, there was maybe an eagerness to know more about other experiences of abolition. On the Ottoman Tunisian side, the context is maybe less known. Uh, it's a really small province uh, within the Ottoman Empire and not at all the center of the empire, one needs to acknowledge. So we have seen that Hussein highlighted the governor of Tunisia's policy, Ahmed uh, Bey's several decisions from 1841 to 1846 to gradually put an end to the enslavement of West Africans in Tunisia. I will here summarize these decisions. And for those who are interested, please have a look at Ismail Montana's book, The Abolition of Slavery in Ottoman Tunisia. So Ahmed Bey started to free every West African slave who set foot on Tunisian lands in August 1841. And then in September of the same year, he issued a decree to take down the buildings of the main public slave market in the main city of Tunis. The following year, in March 1842, he issued another order to the local governors in Tunisia and to the heads of local communities to prohibit the importation of slaves in Tunisia and again to set free all the slaves that would set foot in this province. By January 1843, all children born of slaves were considered free and as equal as other Muslims. But the most important um, decision was made in 1846 
January 23. It was the general proclamation by Ahmed Bey, who decided that every slave in the province of Tunis had to be manumitted. And in this process, public notaries or hudul in Arabic would witness this manumission. So the governor of Ahmed Bey, the governor Ahmed Bey, while presenting all these decisions as his own decisions, took each and every of these steps after consulting the British consul in Tunis, and in a way, after following the recommendations of the British and foreign anti-slavery society. At the same time, Tunisian and British authorities were eager to spread the news across Europe to praise the choices of Ahmed Bey. And here on the right side, you can see a message of gratitude from the British community in Tunis to Ahmed Basha Bey. But referring to the 1840s policy to ban slave trade is not sufficient to get a clear sense of Hussein's intervention. And this intervention, more than one decade after the enactment of Ahmed Bey's decision, need to be understood yet in a broader context, a context of legal and administrative reforms. Three years before Hussein's intervention, in the debate about abolition, by the beginning of the 1860s, in 1861, a new Tunisian governor, Mohamed Sadr Bashabey, enacted the constitution, actually the first constitution in the Muslim world. And you know that the Tunisians love to boast about their country as an exception and as being in the avant-garde of reform. So this constitution restricted the ab absolute powers of the Bey and what is interesting is that this constitution resulted in the creation of several new legal institutions, including a kind of Supreme Court, Al Majlis al Akbar. And this Majlis al Akbar um, included, uh, had 60 members. Um, and among the 60 members, 40 of them were like Hussein bin Abdullah slaves of the governor of Tunisia, of Tunisia or Mamluks. So these slaves or former slaves came like Hussein from Circassia, but as well from Georgia uh, in the Caucasus and from Greece. And they were converted to Islam or Muslims when they came to Tunisia and they were obeying firstly to the Ottoman governors of Tunis. Um, in a way, this new constitution reshaped the positions of these high officials who were slaves within the Tunisian administration. In this new constitutional regime, Mamluks were not only slaves or manumitted slaves of the local governors. They became officers with legal attributions. And in this sense, Hossein's reply in favor of free labor or in favor of new rights for slaves in the US was deeply shaped by local debates within the Ottoman uh, province of Tunis about new legal institutions, about new positions that Mamluk, like Hussein, were claiming for themselves. But there is more. The very fact that Hussein himself chose to reply to the US consul is very telling. During this period, by the beginning of the 1860s, the Ottoman governor of Tunis and his own Mamluks in charge of major positions in the Tunisian administration, put themselves on an equal footing with Western diplomats and European sovereigns. So in paintings, mainly by French artists, the governors of Tunisia and um, the governor of Tunisia and his Mamluks, including Hussein, were represented 
with military uniforms, like across the Ottoman Empire, replicating the gestures and the dignitas of the Western interlocutors. And here you can see two paintings. There is a common point. I mean, we can play this game, but you can see on the white horse in the two paintings, the uh, governor of Tunisia, Mohammed Sadr Bashabe. And behind him uh, with uh, Tarbush or Fez, the red hat, uh, which was the symbol of the Ottoman reforms, you can see uh, some former slaves or slaves of the governor of Tunisia. And one of them is Hussein. I will let you guess maybe with Hussein in these small representations of the painting if you have a huge screen. Um, what is interesting is that we could say that there was clearly something revolving around a common sense of whiteness and masculinity and how white men from both shores of the Mediterranean wanted to be part of a larger political community uh, and of larger authoritarian regimes with military culture. And you can see here um, Napoleon III meeting uh, the governor Mohammed Sadr Bashabe in Algiers in 1861. And in fact, Mohammed Bashabe, that you can see on the White Horse, was uh, providing to Napoleon III a draft of the Tunisian constitution during this visit in Algiers. By um, the same token, um, in his reply to US Consul Perry, Hussein is not only praising a Tunisian example of abolition by manumission, is as well acting not so much as a former slave, but as an official performing his new position in this new reformed state. And he wanted to be seen as someone who count and who's read in Europe, in European news newspaper. It's obvious that Hussein is adapting this speech, his speech to a Western audience. Not only has he chosen to publish his reply in uh, European newspapers such as L'Europe, but he's as well using arguments that were penned by Western thinkers. For instance, when Hussein advocates for the labor of free men versus the labor of slaves, he follows Thomas Jefferson ideas that slaves tend to decrease their master's industriousness. More than that, Hussein wanted to be seen as a role model uh, to the US Council. For instance, he shares in this intervention that was published in European newspapers, an anecdote about his stay in Paris in 1856. I was at the Grand Opera, accompanied by a black boy. I was really surprised when an American jumped at the boy as a cat jumps at the mouth and was about to seize him by his clothes saying, what does the black slave do in a hole? I came close and said to the white man, take it easy, my friend, we are in Paris and not in Richmond, Virginia. As shown by historian Eu Toledano in a paper entitled Late Ottoman Concept of Slavery, Hussein was acting as other Ottoman statesmen um, of his time across the empire, having to react to Westerners' questions about slavery and its abolition in the Muslim world, Hussein contributed to shape a main narrative of the history of slavery in this region that is still prevalent even nowadays in some official circles in, in Tunisia. So this mainstream narrative emphasizes first a main claim that slaves were according to Hussein, well-treated when their masters were eager to follow the basic principles of Islam. Additionally, um, this mainstream narrative portrays even nowadays the 1840s Tunisian gradual policy against slavery as a sign of a so-called Tunisian exception. According to such narrative, 
the Tunisian state became not only aware of the issue of slavery before Western countries like the US and other Muslim countries, but it succeeded as well to enforce on the ground the ban on slave trade. There is the interesting point here is that such, claim, such claims came from a man, Hussein, who had clearly interactions with other slaves within the household of his own masters, the Ottoman governors of Tunisia. For instance, Hussein was the friend, a close friend of two other Mamluks from Circassia who became also high ranked officials within the Tunisian government. And in his daily life, uh, Hussein surely met and saw West African slaves working in Tunis and within the household of his masters, the governors of Tunisia. But to my knowledge, in his own writings and above all in his letters in Arabic, Hussein never advocated for the emancipation of slaves. While by the second half of the 19th century, slaves and above all female West African slaves and female slaves from Circassia were still sold in Tunisia. Therefore, and to partially conclude this talk, I would say that studying at the micro and the regional level, the specific intervention of Hussein on this issue enables us to highlight the many layers of this conversation about the abolition of slavery. It reveals not only the involvement of slaves or former slaves like Hussein in such conversations across the world or their various takes on such issue according to racial, social, and political constructs and agendas. It allows us as well to emphasize the lasting effects of such intervention in shaping official narratives about slavery and its abolition. So while Hossein's argument promoting a Tunisian path towards abolition um, and in favor of the end of slavery in the US, so uh, despite the fact, despite in fact Hossein's intervention, US Consul Amos Perry was not really eager to learn that much from the Tunisians and from a Muslim country, has argued my, my colleague, my former colleague Linda Colley, in her new book, The Gun, the Ship, and the Pen, Amos Perry did not take the new constitution seriously. In his orientalistic book, Carthage and Tunis, Past and Present, Perry compared the Tunisian state to a quote, an unfortunate Bedouin forced to adopt a costume as painful, as ridiculous to look at. The same year that Hussein wrote his, his reply in 1864, the governor of Tunis, Mohammed Sadr Bashabey, decided to withdraw the constitution partly in response to a major uprising across, across the country against new taxes and the creation of new legal courts. And disappointed uh, with the suspension of the constitution, Hussein distanced himself from the Tunisian state. And he started to travel across Europe and he even expressed the will or his will uh, to travel in the US to the Consul Perry. Surprisingly, to my knowledge, Hussein did not write any letter or any report or any travelogue about such day in America. But there are at least two evidences that Hussein actually crossed the Atlantic. Amos Perry provided to Hussein a letter of introduction to his friends in the US describing Hussein as the most enlightened Muslim personage in Tunis. And moreover, on the passenger list of the ship Scotia, I found the name of a man, and this name was Hussein Hussein, who like 
Hussein was hailing from Tunis, as you can see, Turkey, which might mean Tunis from the Ottoman Empire. But this is yet another story to investigate and to tell. Thank you for your attention. I'll... Thank you so much. This is a fascinating talk. And we already have uh, five questions. Um, I don't know. Can you? I think if you can stop your screen share, then yeah, we yeah. Can. Let me. Could you take the hand on that? Because um, let me see. How can I stop? Uh, I cannot. I don't know if Griffin. Can you? Can you help Professor Wally to stop this? Um, thank yeah. you so much. It's not rocket science, but yeah, thank you so much. Let's see. Um, do you see the screen share at the bottom, Professor? Yeah. Ah, there you go. Great. Excellent. So, so we already have questions, and I'm pretty sure that there will be more. But may I may I start with 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 uh, with some with some questions and. And, and thank you so much again for this, for this wonderful talk. Um, first of all, I just want to tell the audience that, that your book is, is, um, is a more detailed discussion of Hussein's life and especially uh, the legal and financial dealings of this very interesting personality through which you actually discover this whole trans-imperial world in the Mediterranean uh, very much, uh, the very much uh, restoring Ottoman agency as well. But before we go there, I just would like to ask whether, um, what, actually what slave means in this context exactly? Or it, do, you, do you define this as a legal category? I mean, Hossein himself, is it a legal category? Do we talk about some type of a legal category here, a social one, a cultural one, a racial one? We have uh, numerous questions and I will pose them in a moment about race. But uh, in, did the, for instance, did the abolishment of slavery or manumission that you mentioned in the, in, I think in 46, finally, mm -hmm. Uh, actually uh, impacted Hussein as well, right? So he's no more a slave in a way yeah. after that date. Uh, but please, please. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I will try to reply quickly to get as much questions as, as you need. But um, so you have two questions, one would say. What does it mean to be a slave when you're a Mamluk? Because Hussein was a Mamluk. So um, and my first book was about the Mamluks in Tunisia, some people like Hussein. So first I will say that I take the legal definition as important because this had an impact on the life of Hussein and other Mamluks because this had an impact on their inheritance, how they would share or split their inheritance depending on the decisions of their masters, which is part of the Islamic law. So clearly, all their lives was absolutely um, affected by this legal definition of slaves. And then, as you said, there is a social and administrative definition of a slave for a Mamluk, because Mamluk is an administrative category. And within this category, you had slaves who were Mamluks, but you have as well free Tunisian people who were seen as Mamluks. So it goes beyond the legal definition. You're absolutely right. And the second question about 1846. 1846, interestingly, was much more about the West African slave than about the Mamluks, which tells something about how the Mamluks like Hussein maybe did not completely define themselves as slaves or define themselves as servants of the state. And we have the same kind of debate within the Ottoman Empire, in the center of the Ottoman Empire, about the very notion of cool, which can mean servants of the Sultan or slaves of the Sultan. Yeah, this is fascinating. And exactly at the same time, actually, in Khedivul Egypt, uh, many Mamluks are in the government in, in, the similar, in, a, in a very similar way. And actually, they continue even under British occupation. 
uh, to to govern to some extent. So so there is a real there is a real Mamluk uh, government governmentalization uh, aspect, at least socially speaking, which is in North Africa certainly, and even in in the center of the Ottoman Empire, as as, as you mentioned. And, um, all right. That's, that's fascinating. Let me pose uh, some of the questions. So let me start um, uh, one, one, one question from George Antonman. Did most Mamluks remain in Tunisia? Did they stay and enrich Tunisian culture to an appreciable extent? Yeah, that's, that's absolutely an interesting uh, question, which is as well related to my first book, but that's fine. Um, um, let me, that's, that's a beautiful question because most of the Mamluks that I know who reached the highest position, even the humble Mamluks stayed in Tunisia. And some of them, the most, let's say, successful Mamluks were at the origin of families, Tunisian families, which are now part of the Tunisian bourgeoisie. For instance, the former president of Tunisia, Qaid Beji um, Qaid Sepsi, who passed away, I think, last year, he's a son or, let's say, an offspring of a Mamluk family. And that's absolutely interesting because the Mamluks are not seen like in the Tunisian culture or Tunisian history clearly as slaves. They are much more seen as part of the state elite, I would say. But, but thank you for so much for your question. But some Mamluks left. Uh, some did escape from Tunisia because they were um, on the verge of being punished by their masters. So they would go to Egypt because they had Arabic. Some would go to Istanbul. In the case of Hussein, interestingly, he left Tunisia to live in Italy where he was involved in different issues. And he died in Italy, in Florence. Thank you very much. Um, from an anonymous, anonymous question, but a very crucial one. Um, to what extent has race played a role in former slaves reaching these high positions and agency in political space in Tunis? Did former black slaves also had the same access to power as white ones? I, I, I just want to add that uh, it's not, not necessary that they were former. Actually, earlier they could have still be slaves. Why, at least legally, why they were in the government, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, look within the category of the Mamluks, at least in the Ottoman province of Tunisia, clearly, and I guess as well in Egypt. One could say that you don't clearly have West African slaves in this category or former West African slaves. They might, you might have some exceptions. So clearly there is something about race here, clearly. But I'm really cautious because I, was, I will not use the notion of white or whiteness because in the Tunisian sources, they are not referring to the notion of whiteness. In fact, each of the Mamluk, I mean, we know the origins of each Mamluk because they have a nisba which is part of the name that indicates the region they are hailing from. So clearly there is something about whiteness, but the sources will not discuss that this way. And like to broaden the scope, if you look at North Africa, there is a specific case in North Africa where you have the promotion of West African slaves, former West African slaves and offspring of former West African slaves. And this is the case of Morocco. In Morocco, you have a specific category, which is the category of Abil Bukhari, which is like the Mamluks in Tunisia, except that most of them are West African slaves, former West African slaves, and black Moroccan subjects of the Sultan. So it tells something as well about the Ottoman Empire, where you don't have this kind of West African slave elites in charge of the administration, if I'm not completely wrong. I mean, at least in the Ottoman province of Algeria, the Ottoman province of Tunisia, and the Ottoman province of Tripoli or Trabus Larabe. Thank you very much. We have more and more questions. Uh, let, me, uh, let me pose a, a question of, of, um, of Professor Abel, actually my, my colleague. So she asks, uh, were considerations of British recognitions for Ahmed Bey's domains 
involved in the proclamation of emancipation. So did sovereignty over these regions imply that they were Dar al-Islam and its inhabitants protected them from becoming enslaved actually? Yeah, I mean, I, I did not completely get this question. If you can rephrase, because something is, is missed. Yeah, could you? Uh, so, so uh, Professor, I noticed that in the, um, the the document in forty six, yeah. noted that Ahmed Bey is extensive and very important African domains. Um, so, were considerations yeah. of British recognition uh, for sovereignty, I presume, for Ahmed Bey's sovereignty against the Ottoman one. But I, I... Yeah, I mean, as a competition, clearly, I mean, the Tunisian governors were playing, uh, let's say, the British and the French against the Ottoman Sultan. I mean, they would obey indeed to the Ottoman Sultans, but they wanted to keep kind of a distance from Istanbul. And they were doing so by relying on the support of the British and the French, and therefore, this policy of Ahmed Basha Bey is clearly part of this effort to get the support of the British and the French forces. If I did understand well the question, yeah, clearly. Uh, I just encourage Professor Eva to, to pose her question again, if she wants to. There is an, a question about whether, uh, this is to us, whether the recording of this lecture will be accessible. We hope so. But we, we will decide after the lecture, right, uh, Professor Waldi? Yeah, I mean, as I said, if it's not a total disaster, I mean, I, I, <laughs> I can share. I mean, I hope I'll be happy to share. I mean, the, the lecture with with the audience clearly. Um, then, um, yes. So, uh, Mohammed Mathi asks: uh, Did Hossein's campaign for the abolition of slavery actually included black slaves from Africa? So I presume, is there any reference to, to, to Black Africans or West Africans? I mean, uh, I did only summarize this uh, paper from the newspaper L'Europe, but clearly it's about West African slaves in Tunis and in the US. But within the paper, you're right. He's not completely acknowledging the fact that there are still slave, West African slaves in Tunisia for him. The policy of Ahmed Bey was successful. And as I said, that's not at all the case. And I'm studying for this European project, uh, the petitions um, from uh, West African female slaves to, to the British consuls by the second half of the 19th century. And you have many of these petitions to get a manumission paper. Thank you so much. Uh, you have also many thanks from the audience for your brilliant lecture. Uh, and let me pose um, a, a very interesting question from Andrew Simon uh, about methodology. So what, uh, how can you reflect please on critical bi biography as a methodology in, 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 in Middle East or North African or Mediterranean research? What fresh insights may this analytical approach provide? Excellent question. Yeah, so, and that brings me back maybe to the second book. So the second book is not completely about this debate about slavery. And it's not completely, I would say about biography. It's much more about a case study and that could be seen as a biography. So what can we make of a case study in rewriting or reinterpreting the history of North Africa? And so the first section of the book is about the life of Hussein, you're right. But the second, the second section is much more about the legacy of Hussein and the conflicts of uh, the inheritance of Hussein. And um, so indeed the biography or the case study can be a tactic to rewrite the history of North Africa. In this book, the main argument is to say that I'll take the case of Hussein and exploring the life of Hussein and the afterlife of Hussein, I will argue that there is a problem with the historiography of North Africa, that we should absolutely uh, reassess the importance of Ottoman legacy within colonial North Africa. That doesn't mean that colonial domination was not violent and was not traumatic. But North Africans 
had other agendas. Some of them did believe that the Ottoman sultans, the Ottoman power, and the Ottoman state were still at the center of their lives, like Hussein, and maybe until the 1920s. So I did not completely reply to your question, but just to say that for me, it's a way to uncover another part, another dimension of the history of North Africa that is often ignored because people are often using European colonial sources to write this history of North Africa, for they, forgetting not only Arabic sources, but forgetting as well the notion of time and history and the fact that some North Africans um, did live in this kind of this Ottoman mental state. Thank you very much. That's that's a that's an excellent question and excellent answer. And I do think that your contribution, both with the, the first book and especially with the second one, is is really the the Ottoman entanglement of of Tunis is is is, is fundamental and um, and it's it's very very fruitful and enlightening. So thank you so much. And I must say I share the view from from Egypt. Um, Okay, uh, there are other questions. Um, um, there is a question from Leslie Wurtzen. Um, uh, sorry. Um, so Leslie finds an interesting contradiction that on the one hand, Hossein seemed to understand abolition of slavery in Tunisia as a process applying to white or non-West African male slaves, even as he seems to uh, be advocating for a more comprehensive abolition in the US. Mm -hmm. So the contradiction that this, this, this attendee points out is that, that, that the, between the, the smaller and the larger context. And second, there is another question. Um, how do you think this legacy of abolition and continued consolidated black enslavement a female black and seven, I presume, impacts social relations in Tunisia today. And uh, uh, I'm thinking of recent court ruling around the name Ati. Yeah, absolutely. So if you're following the news, you saw in The Guardian recently a paper about how some uh, Tunisian citizens from the south of Tunisia mainly are asking or claiming that they should have their name changed because one of the names is Atik, which is indeed problematic. And so clearly, after the Tunisian Revolution in 2011, there are, and this is absolutely fascinating, uh, more organizations, activists who are fighting for the no, right. Sorry, sorry, just, just tell the audience what is Atik because first, not everybody knows that. Right. Yeah. Um, so he's a manumitted slave, if I'm not so wrong. So Atik means a manumitted slave, but sometimes you have Atik of someone. So it's not only Atik, which is problematic, is the fact that you have a connection with the former master in the name. So going back to the Tunisian revolution, this is absolutely fascinating. And so you have these activists, mostly from the main city of Tunis, who are Black Tunisian citizens who are in fact fighting for the rights of Tunisian citizens and against racism within the Tunisian society. And so they have succeeded to convince the government to enact a new law against racism. And I was telling that the um, narrative of Hossein about the abolition of slavery is still really vivid in Tunisia because one of the other decisions is to um, uh, commemorate the abolition of slavery and the proclamation of 1846. And this is in a way interesting, but in a way strange because people should know that it was only a, a step in the process and that even after 46, you still have West African slaves in Tunisia. So I don't know if I replied to the question, but I wanted to say that um, clearly Black Tunisian activists are absolutely crucial in the post-revolutionary uh, context in Tunisia, but at the same time, they are fighting against like a main narrative, which is all about the idea of Tunisian exception. 
And this idea of Tunisian exception can be a bit problematic sometimes because then some Tunisian would think that we don't have any problem with slavery and the legacy of slavery because it was solved in 1846, but it was not at all solved and there is still a legacy of slavery. Thank you so much. This is wonderful. In actually, in, in Egyptian legal texts, Ma'atuk uh, or Ma'atuka are the are the, uh, the manumitted slaves, so not the attic, so not the fa'il, but uh, the mafa'ul. Um, um, at least in legal uh, texts and what was and so on and so on. So uh, what uh, I would like to ask is uh, another question. Well, um, there are many questions about the remaining legacies of slavery in Tunisia, Jerba. Um, um, and I also ask another question related to this. Did Tunisian abolitionis abolitionism directly influence any other parts of the world at all? Asks, these are anonymous questions. And then the third one is, is Islam root, was rooted in, in this abolitionism in, in Tunisia? Uh, because it is well known that in, 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 uh, in, in Islamic law or theology, there is a strong reward in Islam to, to free slaves. Um, I wonder if you, if you can talk to this question. Yeah, I will reply to these two questions, starting with the last one about Islam and abolition in Tunisia. So I had to be efficient and summarize some of the ideas. But when I was talking about the policy implemented by Ahmed Bey, indeed Ahmed Bey was involving local ulama, local Islamic scholars, who were as well replying to Ahmed Bey as they were replying to, to uh, with, with fatwas. So there was a debate among Islamic scholars in the 1840s in Tunisia, and we have those texts. And indeed, they would frame the conversation about the fact that Muslims in Tunisia were not obeying to the basic principles of Islam and that a Muslim should manumit his slaves. And so the conversation was clearly an Islamic conversation. It was not only about the British arguments. So this is one part of, of the discussion. And uh, I was referring to the book by Ismail Montana. So you can have a look at this book about this Islamic conversation. You can as well look at the works in French by Ines uh, Delimrad. I can send some links at some point if you're interested. So there is something about, uh, there is a conversation about Islamic principles. And about the influence of Tunisia, this is a small province. And I should say that if we contextualize Tunisia, um, in fact, there was a, a similar process across the Ottoman Empire. I guess that in Egypt, during fairly the same period, the slave market was closed, I think, in Cairo. And even in Istanbul, you had the same kind of policy. It's not that Tunisia was that influential. In fact, the British uh, pressure was strong um, on several uh, Ottoman provinces, uh, the Ottoman province of Trabzon, Arab, Libya, Egypt, and on the center of the Ottoman Empire. Thank you very much. We we do still have some questions. I wonder, Griffin, if we can go over and if Prof Professor Waldi, would you take a few minutes more? Uh, because yeah. I think officially we we, should, we stop at two p.m. as far as I understand. But so can we have time to go over a little more. We started a few minutes late, so please continue. Okay, if, if Professor Waldi is, is okay with that. Yeah, this is my pleasure. Thank you so much. So then, then let's go, um, let's go uh, more a little bit. Um, so there is a, um, there's an interesting question. Um, how would you explain the current racism in North African countries toward black people? Do words like abd refer to actually the Arab Ottoman slavery? And to what extent uh, is the history of slavery in North Africa recognized by the states, the governments themselves today? Um, I presume you can talk to Tunisia, but perhaps other states as well. Yeah, so um, I start with the last part of the question. So as, as I said, the Tunisian state after the revolution did acknowledge this past, but in a, like an official way, 
much more focusing on the first, let's say, abolition of 1846, and maybe forgetting the other part of the story during the second half of 19th century. And there was a second abolition in 1890 in Tunisia during the colonial period uh, under the influence of the British uh, policy. So let's say that there is a recognition, there is an acknowledgement by the Tunisian state. And regarding the racism against uh, black people and West Africans in North Africa, this is a huge and broad question. So if the question is about, is there a part of an Ottoman legacy or, and all ancient forms of racism, clearly there is many words that were used during the 19th century, which are again used uh, today. And most of the black Tunisian activists are as well fighting against the use of this kind of words. For instance, uh, Kahlouch, which is, has been seen by many Tunisians, has not really pejorative, uh, not really uh, problematic, is problematic. Kahlouch would mean, how to say that, uh, not to, but uh, how would you translate that, uh, Adam? Kahlouch would mean, yeah. Uh, it's 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 seen by Tunisians as not really der derogatory, but it was. It Kahlouch means small, small black, little black, which is usually problematic. So, and these words like Shushan as well were used in the 19th century. So there, I mean, it's complicated to uh, unpack the roots of racism in North Africa. But if I study the 19th century, I can see that there is a legacy of the 19th century practices and discourses, but it's not only that clearly. Uh, thank you. Actually, meanwhile, uh, the audience also uh, said Kahlouch to translate that in English as blacky or yeah. a little black person. Uh, yeah. yeah. Blacky would, would be something like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. Um, there is an uh, there, there is a question about um, um, female slaves mm -hmm. in Tunisia. Whether so, how long and and how long were there the female slaves in, in, in Tunisia? Uh, you, and, and how is it possible that after ab abolition, there, there, is, there is still female slavery, of course? I would add a footnote to this question. And I would also add, um, if, if I may, uh, whether race and gender here has some connections more closely than, than, than we often think, yeah. uh, you, you always mentioned that this uh, circassian or Cherkes, of course, for Ottoman, mm -hmm. the, the Cherkes um, uh, Mamluks are in high government positions and they are, of course, white. Um, and, and we don't really find uh, West African or black uh, slaves in such high government positions, but we do find them certainly in the Pasha's uh, harems, in very, sometimes very influential economic positions as the main agents of the mothers, for instance, uh, of the of the Pasha's mothers or, or wives. And, and so is there a connection here? So how long were there female slaves in, in Tunisia? And is there a connection here somehow between between race and 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 and, um, and gender? Yeah, gender for sure. I mean we know I mean, we know that by the two, three first decades of um, the 20th century during the colonial period, you had like Cherkes uh, female slaves, not that many, but there is an interesting case of Komar Beya, who was the wife of three Beys or three Ottoman governors during the colonial period. And then for the female slave, West African female slave, I'm working on that, so be patient. Um, I, as I said, I'm really fascinated by the petitions of these West African female slaves um, that they would uh, bring to European consuls in Tunisia. And you have the same kind of petitions, I think in West Africa at the same times by the end of the 19th century. So clearly we are sure that by the end of the 19th century, you had these female slaves. And some would even, um, go to courts 
uh, and to um, uh, uh, and they had claims against their masters, female female master or male masters, and about the reasons why it's really about gender and race in the case of West African slaves. So, and this is quite known because slavery in some parts of North Africa, let's say the Northern part of North Africa, not maybe the South, not the Sahara for instance, even in Egypt or the center of the Ottoman Empire, it's about households. And for the French in Tunisia during the colonial period, or let's say for the Italians in Libya or the Spanish forces in Spain, not easy to go within households and to intervene and ask for the liberation or the freedom of female slaves working as domestics within households. Sometimes these European powers were not interested at all in um, improving the situation of these female slaves, but often, because they were within families and within households, um, there was clearly a problem. And this might explain why female slaves and West African female slaves were the last slaves in uh, 19th century and 20th century North Africa, according to a legal status. Thank you very much. Um, that's that's uh, very, very interesting. I myself see actually female slaves, Cherkas there, um, until the 1920s in mm. Egypt, in petitions. Uh, perhaps by that time they, they did not have this status, but originally they, they were actually even the 30s. Mm. Okay. Um, um, Nancy Ko asked a question. Um, it's a long question um, about that it is that uh, she's fascinated by Hossein ibn Abdallah's position, not only in relation to American slavery, but in relation to British abolition. So that the question is, um, if, if comparing US to the Ottoman Empire or to Tunis, is Hussein attempting also to place the Ottoman Empire specifically on the same plane as the British Empire? Is there a British invisible angle in, in this particular correspondence that you looked at? Meaning that uh, Hussein wants to portray the Ottoman Empire as the same kind of political force than the British Empire, I guess? Yes, I guess that it has a moral legitimacy uh, the, the same way the British yeah. name. So in a way, uh, Hossein positions himself as a uh, yeah. I mean, and British and anyway, yeah. North American. I, I will share maybe the, the paper that was published in L'Europe. Uh, my sense is that uh, Hussein was much more thinking as a provincial man I mean, has part of like the Ottoman province of Tunisia. It's much more by the 1860s that he would look at the Sultan and the Ottoman Sultan has the center of the empire when in fact Tunisia was facing the uh, imperialistic ambitions of France, Italy and uh, British forces. So I wouldn't say that he's really like playing the British or the Ottoman Empire versus the British one, yeah. Thank you very much. Now there is perhaps one last uh, question which is rather contemporary and I'm not sure if you can answer or you want to answer, but I still pose. Uh, is there a diff by an anonymous uh, question attendee, is there a difference between how North African countries and the Gulf states uh, look at the, the recognition of, of slavery uh, today, I presume, or in, in the past. Yeah, clearly a tough one to end the conversation because I really am not an expert on the Gulf states, but I guess that the person asking the question has some knowledge. So please share with me uh, if, if you can. So thank you so much. Well, uh, thank you very much. Um, this was a, a, a wonderful lecture and a wonderful conversation. And I would really like to thank once more uh, Griffin, uh, Julie, and Ellen McLarney, the director of the Middle East Center, and most of all to you, uh, uh, Professor Wildy. 
and it was a real pleasure. Thank you so much. Um, and I really want to also thank the attendees. And I don't know what will happen right now, but thank you so much. It, it's a great, uh, please join me to- Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Now I can have like some dinner in Paris. <laughs> thank you so much during the lockdown. See you next now, time. Thank you so much for putting that together. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you all. It was our honor. Thank you.